hello! Today we are doing kind of an unusual video because it's really mostly audio. I decided to make my Psy Changeling series wrap up a full you know, main channel post here, which normally I just put them in uh, like as unlisted and put them in a playlist for those who want to consume it here versus on the podcast. But today I decided since this was the big wrap up episode that I wanted to go ahead and make it a main channel video. So you'll be getting a lot of audio from me in this. So I just wanted to kind of set the stage for that. This is going to be, I mean, if you want no context or spoilers for Side Changeling, then I guess don't listen to this, but the purpose of this is to be a somewhat spoiler-free discussion in terms of kind of like the biggest plot reveals. So if you don't want to know any of the couples that get together, you know, at any point in the series, if you don't want any context for anything, then yes, don't watch this. But if you are okay with, let's call it like l mild spoilers, then I think you can keep watching. So with that... Throw it over to Podcasting Mara. Did you guys think that I forgot you? I would not blame you if you did. Uh, it has taken me so much longer to do my re-listen than I thought it would. Um, in part because I became, or slash still am, obsessed with Mormon story podcasts. Am I Mormon? No. Have I ever been Mormon? No. But that has been taking up a lot of my normal podcast slash audiobook listening time. So <laughs> this has taken so much longer than I thought it would. So I apologize for that. The peace offering I have for you is that um, I have also, the reason it was taking me so long is because I was taking so many notes. And what I'm going to do is give you two bonus episodes. Uh, I, they will come out sometime around Storm Echo, um, but they are gonna be a full series plot recap. So I'll kind of do the high level plot recap so that I have it to reference in the future whenever new books are coming out and hopefully that will be helpful to you guys as well. And then I'm also, I took notes to do a ghost foreshadowing episode. So that will be full spoilers. Both of those will be full spoilers. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's a good peace offering. But we'll get into some of the like timing of the next season logistics and stuff at the end. But today what we are going to do is we're going to run through my full ranking of the Side Changeling series now that I have done my reread. And we're also going to do sort of a theme and plot, no, not plot, specifically not plot since that's the bonus episode, theme and sort of like motif. Um, recap like now that I've done the full read kind of what my takeaways are in terms of sort of the big ideas that I think that this series is dealing with and kind of what I think all of that is about so snuggle in get some popcorn I've got my nail polish out I'm gonna be painting them while I talk to you guys you know like we're at a sleepover you know spilling some hot goss and uh yeah I'm excited to put a bow on the first season of this podcast so let's start with our book ranking. And I'm going to tell you, when I, I, you know, I was kind of ranking things as we went along, moving things around. I did a final sort of recalibration before, uh, before this episode. If you had asked me what my favorites and least favorites were, I don't, this would not, I think, have been the order I would have put them in. And I find that exciting and delightful because that means that I'm having kind of new experiences of the books, even though, you know, I love them and have loved them since I read them. Um, but I do have sort of some new perspectives now that we've done the full reread. So first, well, we'll start, we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. And I am going to include Storm Echo in this ranking. And I'm not going to get into plot specific spoilers for anything. I'm just going to say kind of what like why I rank them the way I did. So I think that this section should be should be mostly spoiler free. Um, yeah, I think in general. Yeah, I think this episode in general should be relatively spoiler free. I mean, if you want to know nothing about the series, maybe don't listen to this. But I don't think that I'm going to give away any big 
reveals. Starting at the bottom, we are putting, this This is definitely a change from when I first started, uh, we are going to put Bonds of Justice at the bottom. I'm, I'm very surprised by this because this definitely doesn't suffer from what coming into the reread, my main critique of the series was, which is that in my memory, the earlier books had more alphaness in their romances than I care for. While we did find that somewhat, um, and in one book in particular that we'll talk about, I did not have as much of a problem with that in this reread as I thought I would. I therefore just get to kind of have new criteria for evaluating these. And my problem with Bonds of Justice is not that there's anything wrong with it. It's just that it's pretty forgettable. Like even when I, <laughs> so when I was preparing for this and I was doing the re-listen, I was like, oh yeah, that is what happened. You guys, I reread this book, I think like a year ago, I, not that long ago. And I had already, and I recorded a whole ass podcast about it. And I had already kind of forgotten what happened in it. So like, it's fine. I just think given how awesome some of these books are, its biggest sin, I think it's just that it's a little bit bland. Even though when I did my, sorry, that's the nail polish bottle. Let me finish this corking, corking. There's, there's no cork. There's just a, a cap. Maybe I'm just capping that. Um, there's nothing wrong with this book. I'm not offended by it. There's not like problematic elements. And actually there's very big macro plot things that happen in this book. But I think it just felt so, I don't know if it was the pace. I don't know. This book is just of all of the side changeling, I think the most forgettable book, which considering how much stuff does happen in that book is kind of a feat. So I'm going to put that at number 21. Oh, I should also mention, I'm not ranking any of the um, novella collections or short stories in this. This is just main novel. So that's number 21. Number 20 is Ocean Light. And the reason I've got it so low is because it was the first time in the series I thought, is Nalini Singh running out of ideas? Because I just felt like even though it's again, perfectly enjoyable. All of these books, the lowest rating I gave any of these, we're in three star territory right now. That is the lowest rating I gave, which for me is a B. So perfectly fine, a good version of a paranormal sci-fi romance kind of deal. But I just felt like, ugh, we've seen this conflict so many times at this point. The only new thing was sort of the changeling racism towards a human. So I think that that, I guess, is something new. Um, I should also mention my two bottom ones are both the two that include a human with either a sire or changeling. So I wonder if I'm just not as compelled by that part of the world. I don't know. But yeah, I just felt like while Ocean Light had some fun reveals, we got some answers. Um, we got some good setup in terms of the human alliance on a macro plot level. I just felt like this, especially the romance, it just felt like something we've seen again and again. So for that reason, I just it wasn't a favorite. And then number 19 is Blaze of Memory, uh, which I also gave, ended up giving three stars to. The reason I've got it so low is because I just didn't love the romance, even though it is got to be probably the angstiest book in the series. It basically ends up being sort of cichlet by the end. Um, it's so angsty and I've wept. I think I've read this book three times, all three times I've wept reading it. But I just don't really love the dynamic between Katya and Dev. Like it's just not my favorite um, romance trope, which is sort of the, I hate you, like enemies to lovers kind of deal. He is pretty on the alpha spectrum, which makes sense given his abilities, but I don't think it had any of the kind of warmth to kind of spice it up a little bit more for me than some of the other 
heroes who've had similar powers. I don't know. This one just, I don't think that the romance worked for me. And this was a very romance focused entry in the series as opposed to macro plot. Let's put it this way. I, when people are reading the series, I'm like, if you wanted to skip from Branded by Fire straight to Play of Passion, you kind of could. You'd miss some macro plot stuff, but like not a ton. So that's part of why I feel like seven and eight just kind of belong lower in the list. Okay, then Mind to Possess is number 18. And it's my highest ranked three star. Coming into this project, I would have told you this was my least favorite because what I most remembered about it is the romantic dynamic, which is the first half of the book has this and it's my least favorite. The first half of this book is my least favorite romance in the series because it is such the classic aughts uh, alpha hole where he is angry that she left and he's like punishing her. But then like he's also super, it's just like the classic alpha hole. Once they get together, which is I think at kind of the midway, like 50 to 60% mark, it's a 180 and I love their dynamic. So it's like, I remember when I, when I was listening to the podcast where I kind of landed was the first half of this book is a two star. The back half of this book is a four star. So the back half of this book, I loved so much more than what I remembered, but I think the first half of this really weighed it down for me. And a lot of that just comes down to personal preference in terms of romance tropes. But for me, it just, the, it just didn't work. But ultimately, there are parts of this book I love. So that's why I put it as the highest three star. Okay, now we're moving into 3.5 star territory. And this is what I would describe as B plus books. 3.5 is a B plus for me. All of this, I should also say I do relative to my expectations for a book. And I have very high expectations for Nalini Singh. So if these books were not, if any of these books were not by Nalini Singh, you could probably bump their rating up by a half to a full star because um, she's just so great. So she gets graded a little bit on a curve. Um, okay, so number 17 my lowest 2.5 star is Allegiance of Honor. And I actually, this is the first book where I really changed my rating from the first time I read it. I was trying to make notes of where I, I changed an actual rating and not just sort of a ranking. Um, the first time I gave this three stars and this time I gave it three and a half because I think now that we're further in to season two, I have a lot more appreciation for um, how much macro plot stuff we get in Allegiance of Honor. I was under the impression when I first read it that it was kind of purely a hangout book, which don't get me wrong, I love and I appreciate authors taking the time for us to see characters that we know and love, especially in the context of a romance series. I think sometimes couples get together and then they, you just never really see them again. And I love that in this series, that's not the case. Like we keep following their lives. We get to see them continuing to grow and, you know, have kids or have their relationship mature or whatever. Like I really appreciate that. So it's not a bad thing to have a hangout book, but in my memory, this one just didn't have a lot of substance to it. And while there's parts, in some ways I still feel that way, but now that we're further into season two, I really see how much of the chessboard she sets up in this book. And I will say, I think that this book could have been a four or maybe even a four and a half star if instead of having all the plot lines running kind of together throughout the book, like interwoven, if she had taken an approach of having like six or seven novellas that were all happening in the same timeline. I think that could have actually been a really dynamic approach to this particular book because she's so good at writing novellas that I think that that could have helped it have a little bit more of a punch. I think it all happening at the same time just makes it feel a little overwhelming. And that kind of diminishes the overall impact of all the things that are happening. So that's just my little like... <laughs> If I were editing this, that would have been my suggestion. But it's still got so many good character moments and so much good plot setup that I feel like it definitely got deserved to get bummed from a three to a three and a half. Okay, and then number 16 is Hostage to Pleasure, which is another one that I increased the rating for because on my first reread, 
or on my first read, I gave this three stars. And I thought that this and Mind Possessed were my least favorites, like in my memory, because I remember Dorian being much more of an alpha hole than he actually is in this book. It's more that he's that way in earlier books, but we get to see him mature by the time he and Ashaya are getting together. And while there is still some of that, like I wouldn't say it's my favorite romance in their book, like as they grow together, it's great. But um, I, it's still not my favorite romantic dynamic, but Ashaya is so great. She's one of the best heroines in the series, I think. And the macro plot stuff in this is fantastic. So I felt like that bumped it. Like I would give the romance a three star, but I would give the macro plot a four. So that's why now I would give it a three and a half. Uh, and then another one that I increased my rating for, and I would have said, oh, I can't remember which of these. I, I always thought of Mind to Possess, Hustage to Pleasure, and Tangle of Need as my three least favorites in the series, and I'm not. I think I said each of these were my least favorite in different context, but I kind of thought of them as my least favorites. This time, I think because I was older, more mature, um, have become more world weary, <laughs> like beaten down by life. When I came to Tangle of Need this time, I actually really liked it. Um, my critique of this one is that I think it sh it would have been a four star if it had been a novella. And instead of having the Kenji Jim novella, I think that should have been number 11 and the and, um, the Tangle of Need couple, oh gosh, I forget their names right now. Um, they should have been the novella. Like I think if the links had been swapped, they both would have been better stories because I think part of what this book suffers from is that it's kind of like a sequel to Hawk and Sienna's story in on top of being the main couple's story. And I think a, the first time around, I just loved our heroine so much. And I was like, she deserves to have somebody be her actual mate, because that's kind of the the cool um, further exploration of the world is like, what happens with two changelings who decide to be together who aren't actually mates. Um, and I think that that was a really I think especially now that I'm older, I understand and and kind of like appreciate that kind of a story a little bit more. Um, but I just love this heroine so much that it feels like she deserves to have a mate, like have the full fairy tale. And I think in subsequent books, we get some hints that like, kind of, maybe that is gonna happen fully eventually. But anyway, um, so anyway, I just I think I came to this book and loved it so much more than the first time I gave it three stars the first time I gave it three and a half this time because I do still have some sort of like plot pacing critiques. But I think that aside from that, I really like their story in a way that I didn't the first time. So that was definitely a very pleasant surprise. And then my next three and a half, I'm gonna say is Vision of Heat, which is number 14 on this list. Uh, because I think it's a perfectly, it's a really good book. It's very entertaining. And because it's so early in the series, it helps set up so much of the macro plot and so much of the world building. So like, I still think it's really good. And actually, I had a friend recently who just started the series, and she she actually preferred Visions of Heat to um, Slave to Sensation, which surprised me a little bit. But uh, I just think that because Slave to Sensation has such a big um, like tension point of how getting out of the Sinet is gonna work. I think that the Visions of Heat suffers from being somewhat anticlimactic because we know what the solution to that is. So it, it diminishes some of the tension in the second book because I'm like, well, I know, I kind of know what's gonna happen. Um, so I think that's really the only knock against it. I also, when I was um, re-listening, I remembered that I also think that this has some of its time elements in terms of consent around touch that I think in a post Me Too world just reads differently. I don't think that that's like sort of the book's posture towards it or the authorial intent or anything. I just think that at the time that was a pretty commonly accepted thing of heroes still sort of like, oh, you say you don't want to be touched, but I know your body better than you kind of a thing. And so I just, ugh, I, I didn't love that. That was kind of the sour note in the book, even though I love Vaughn and Faith and I really enjoy when they show up later. Um, 
but yeah, anyway, so that, that was the only kind of knock against this one. And then my top three and a half star is actually one that I originally gave four stars to, and this time around I gave it three and a half because I do have some sort of plot pacing issues with it, uh, and that is Silver Silence. So it's number 13, and I love the character so much in this book. Like, Silver is one of the best heroines. Valentine is so lovable. I mean, I love them together. Ugh, I just don't know. I don't know about the way that we kind of build really quickly in the middle part of it and then have a totally new conflict. I just think upon reread, I don't know that that was the most successful pacing choice. Um, so yeah, I guess that's where I'll leave it. I really, I mean, there's so much to love about this book. We also get a lot of Maybe some of it is that we have to do a lot of world building in this one because it's sort of the first full book in the second season. Um, so we get a lot of sort of uh, like we're meeting the bears really for the first time. Like we've definitely gotten allusions to them in earlier books. Uh, they've been around, but this is our first time spending time with them and really like bonding with all of the characters who are so lovable and we all love it now when the bears show up. But this was the first book kind of establishing them. So I also wonder if it suffered somewhat from that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like this is one I want to love more than I actually do. But anyway, so that's number 13. And number 12, I can't say a lot about because it's my lowest four star, but like still a very solid four, which for me is an A minus. And that is Storm Echo. It's the book that's coming out here in a couple of months. I'm really excited for you guys to read it because we get some extremely satisfying macro plot payoff in this. I think the micro plot suffers because it is retreading ground that we, the audience, have already seen, but the characters don't know about yet. So for me, that's the only reason why this wasn't a four and a half, to be totally honest, because like the macro plot stuff in this is absolutely fantastic. I cannot wait for you guys to read it and get to enjoy it. Um, and also in re-listening to things uh, for this episode, I got to, I, there's even more like foreshadowing than I'd realized. Oh, okay. I can't wait. Anyway, I'll stop. I know you guys probably hate me. You guys are going to love this book. Okay. Then um, number 11, also four stars, is Last Guard, which was last year's release. Uh, again, I think that there's some super satisfying and very interesting macro plot stuff established. And this has the same kind of relationship dynamic that my favorite book in the series has, um, which I guess I won't fully get into, but it's very much a, I think I'm too broken to love someone kind of a morality chain-esque. Uh, is that true? No, not quite morality chain. I think that that's a little bit different. But I think that in terms of the I, I think I'm too broken to love or be loved. I'm just a sucker for that. And I think that this served that really nicely. I also really liked um, some of its thematic stuff around mental illness and um, abledness. I thought that was really interesting. And yeah, I think that we I enjoyed getting a new setting. And um, also just like learning more about the the anchors because they especially in my re listen to my episodes, I hearing it all kind of together made me realize that we have heard a lot about the anchors over the years. But I think that this like spending time with one of the main anchors was really interesting. So there's that. Um, and then number 10, uh, with four stars is Shards of Hope. Listen, guys, I know some people do not like Zara. I do not understand it. I am a Zara stan. I love her. Again, this is the I think I'm too broken to love trope, which I am, as we just discussed, a sucker for. I loved getting some of the macro plot payoffs in this one. It's sort of a, I think in my mind, this had been um, really like the climactic ending to season one, which it is in some ways, but actually really uh, Shield of Winter is sort of really the culmination of everything that we'd been building to in season one. And Shards of Hope is sort of not fully a transition book to season two, but it's sort of the denouement in terms of the macro plot stuff. So we get a lot of really interesting things, um, especially some payoff with Aden, Aiden in particular. 
Uh, but yeah, anyway, so I love Shards of Hope and I will not stand for Zara slander on this channel. Okay, thanks. Um, and then next is Shield of Winter, like we were just talking about. Uh, yeah, I just think that we, I love Vasek and Ivy, love them. One of my favorite couples in the series. He's definitely highly reminiscent, I think, of Judd. So, you know, I'm a sucker for that. And I think their dynamic is really lovely. And we get so much good macro plot stuff in this one. I think that the only thing that keeps us from being a four and a half for me is some of a little bit of the pacing stuff. Very nitpicky, but this is uh, absolutely wonderful. So that's number nine. And then my top number, uh, my top four star book and number eight in this ranking is Alpha Knight, which I originally gave four and a half to. So this was a half star down just because I think upon reread, it wasn't, especially in context of reading all of the books together, I kind of reserved the four and a half and fives for the truly, for me, next level iconic books in this series. There are just so many good ones that that's really hard <laughs> to get into that very, very top bit. So that's really the only thing I'm dinging it down for. But I really love this um, in terms of, it, it felt like a real return to form when I read it because it felt like getting back to what I love best about the series, which I felt like the last three books prior to that had been a lot of establishing of season two. And this was really me getting back to some of the core relationship dynamics I really enjoy, um, world building stuff, macro plots. St I mean, it just really delivered for me. And this is the book that I really went like, oh no, okay, we're good. Like it took I, a little bit of a rocky start getting going into season two for me, but now this is reminding me that yes, I think we have many more iconic books ahead, uh, including the next one, which was the book that came out right after that. And that is uh, Wolf Rain, which is my first four and a half star book, which for me is an A. And that is uh, number seven in this ranking. And Wolf Rain, Again, this has a I, I am too broken to love. I'm realizing in this ranking and as I'm talking about it, clearly that is one of my core sort of stories that I love in a romance. Um, yeah, so I love that we're getting our first instamating, considering this was what, number 18 in the series, plus however many novellas, the fact that we'd never really gotten a full instamating story before. I love that she took this long for it. And I love the reasoning behind that. And I loved seeing a female alpha. Selinka is a great, great iconic heroine in the series. Um, I, they're so great. to Yeah, this, this one just really spoke, I think, to my inner, <laughs> just like what I love in a romance story. And I really loved seeing a, a fresh dynamic um, in a Psy and Changeling mating. So that was really great. Uh, and then number six, <clears throat> I bumped up a half star for my first reading. When I first read this, I gave it four. This time I'm giving it four and a half. So it went from an A minus to an A. And that is Slave to Sensation, number six. That is the book that started, all, started it all. I think I have so much more appreciation for this book um, upon reread. I'd always in my mind and I think I've even said this before, told people like, okay, you got to get through books one and two to get to book three inside Changeling. That's when you will be hooked. It's one of the best books in the series. I still feel that way. We'll get there. Um, keep reading. Even if you don't love book one or two, keep going to book three because that's really when things get to get in. And I think that this book upon reread this time really made me revise kind of my own narrative and how I pitched this this series to people. Now I will still tell people, if you like Slave to Sensation at all, do keep reading at least to Caress by Eyes, because I think that's when you'll know if you're like, gonna go the distance with the series. But Slave to Sensation is a really interesting, incredibly well told story. I think it's, it's honestly kind of a master class in a, in a first entry in a series. She does so much world building. She's, I mean, the amount of foreshadowing guys in this book. And again, having, when I interviewed her and kind of talking through what her process is, I think that she is, it's more that she is a really good reader of her own stories than she is necessarily like, 
oh, I know that this is going to happen in book 20. But she does so much good world building that allowed her to take the books in such a compelling direction. Like, I, I was really shocked upon my reread how much foreshadowing there is in, in this book, how many characters we see, you know, even to this day, how many things that we get like a hint to in that book that maybe she didn't even know she was going to do that eventually, but like, it totally reads that way. I think the emotional dynamic in this is fantastic. Like, I don't think that I love Lucas and Sasha the way some people do. So I really like them a lot. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're definitely a top tier couple for me in the series. But I think that little extra X factor for me that, um, frankly, all five of the couples beyond this have, um, it just wasn't, it's not quite there. So that's the only reason why I'm not giving it a five star. But um, yeah, I just think that this was, I think rereading really increased my own appreciation for how great of a first book in a series this is. So yes, four and a half stars at number six, number five, and my top four and a half star is Branded by Fire. The reason this one kind of opposite of Slave to Sensation, I wish that there was more macro plot in this stuff. Like for this to have been a perfect book, which is what I think of five stars, this would have had a little more macro plot stuff happening in it. It also is paced in the middle of um, books four, five, and seven are all this one specific kind of micro arc within the series. And I think the fact that this one sort of interrupts it a little bit take some of the micro or the macro plotness away. But this is one of they um, Riley and uh, Oh, God, what's her name? Riley, buh, buh, Br I want to say Brandy. That's not her name. I cannot think of it right now. But Mercy, duh. Okay, Riley and Mercy. <laughs> Here we go. Oh man, can you tell that I'm still making my way through my first cup of coffee here? Um, are one of my favorite couples in the series. I love that they, I, and I think I also have a much bigger appreciation now of how pivotal that this book is to the alliance between Snowdancer and Dark River. Um, w their relationship really lays the groundwork for everything that happens between those two packs going forward in a way that I think really, I appreciate that this got set up in the way that it did. And then it's continued to pay off. I mean, the pup cubs, like, all of that just continues to pay dividends from this book. And Riley and Mercy's dynamic is so beautiful. And I love them together. And I love that, like, the whole conflict is about her as a woman, like, can I kind of stay true to who I am in this relationship? Ah, oh, so good. I, uh, I just love this relationship so, so much. Also, some of the steamiest sex scenes, I feel like, in the entire series. So, you know, it, it literally the book starts with a hate bang in the forest. So, you know, um, if, if that's what you're reading these books for, I think this one definitely delivers. Okay, we are officially in five star territory. A little drum roll here. Okay, number four is Play of Passion. Now, if uh, I had originally given this four and a half, four or four and a half stars. Upon reread, though, I again, love an alpha female. Um, a very similar conflict, actually, to now that we're talking about them back to back, uh, branded by fire. Also, I just realized that the three um, siblings <laughs> are all here just uh, three, two, one. So we get Riley's book is number my number five. Uh, Drew's book is my number four. And his heroine indigo is again, it's a very similar question of like, can he handle that I am more dominant than he is? Can he handle um, kind of like where we are in the pack uh, hierarchy? She's also a little bit older than him. So she's seeing him in a new way. I love their romance so much. And we it is like also building some of the macro plot stuff that really pays off in the next couple of books. The run I always tell people the run from book nine to book 14 in Side Changeling is just such good reading. Ugh. Okay. So anyway, so they're my number four. And they definitely went up um, to a full five star this time because I am like, yes, I am just trash for all of this dynamic. He is still so strong. But he's also beta is not quite the right word, but he's just not he's not an alpha hole. And I just love, love seeing that. So 
that's number four. Number three, down a peg, I will say, um, from where I would have guessed I would put this originally, but I still love this book, is Crest by Ice with the iconic Judd and Brenna. Brenna rounding out the three siblings. Um, I, Brenna is one of my favorite heroines in the series. Like she is so strong and what she overcomes from her past trauma is beautiful. And Judd, it just, my heart melts for Judd because again, it's the whole, I'm too broken to be loved. And it's like, Judd, you are the opposite of that. You are so wonderful. Oh, Judd is one of Jed might be the most loved hero in the series by the fandom in general. I mean, I love Judd. And also, I, it's so fun in season two. He's just mellowed so much. We get to see his humor. We get to see him like really like what their love does for him. And also like her still being one. Uh, I don't know, guys, I love it. And also so much good macro plot stuff in this one. Um, yeah, I think you could, I mean, why would you? But people could read books one through three as their own little trilogy. Because I think, I think Crest by Ice pays off a lot of the things that happened in the first two books and sets up interesting things for the rest of the series. Uh, but yeah, this is a perfect book, a perfect sci-fi romance. Love it. Uh, also, another, probably, if I'm trying to be objective, my number two is probably the best book in the series in terms of, I don't know that I have a single critique of this book. It is a masterclass of payoff, of invest, getting your audience to invest in your characters and then paying it off in the most satisfying way. And just having really satisfying macro plot stuff happening, having an incredibly effective romance and selling us on a pretty big age gap romance that I think I could have been squicked out by in less capable hands. Uh, all that to say, Kiss of Snow is a perfect book. Like I don't, for like what it is um, and where it is in a series, like this is a perfect book. It's such good payoff um, for Hawk and Sienna. They continue to grow together in the back half of the series. We're now at the point where they've been together for more than half the series and we continue to see them show up and have you know, meaningful growth together. Um, it angst, angst so good. Oh, it is like really paying off a lot of the buildup of um, kind of like what Sienna's power is. And the final scene of Kiss of Snow or like sort of the big battle is so perfectly executed, so satisfying. And just my own catharsis of getting Sienna to just have her moment to show everybody like, yeah, you guys have been kind of drastically underestimating me from literally every side. Ming fucking Laban, you've been underestimating me. Uh, changelings, you do not understand my power. The only people who really understand like how full, like what a badass I am have been my uncles. They are really the only two who had any correct assessment of the magnitude of my power. And now you're gonna all see it. It is so satisfying. It's been building for 10 books and this is a perfect book. I just, the only thing that keeps this from being number one is that my number one is literally one of my top 10 favorite books of all time ever. And it just speaks to me on a level that I cannot fully explain to you. And that is Heart of Obsidian. Heart of Obsidian is my number one. It's my, it's in my, I, I'm trying to think of what other books I have in my top 10 books ever. One of, one of my favorite romances, like, I guess really only like Jane Eyre, Pride and Prejudice. Uh, and yeah, probably those were really the only two I like better than this. It is just, I love the payoff. This is another one that is a masterclass of paying off something that has been building for 12 books. It's a morality chain. So like the fact that she gets me so fully on board with like some, you know, potentially unlikable uh, characters. The fact that in my reread, I realized that she had literally started foreshadowing this from the second book. L guys, this, ugh. 
She literally starts paying, like building this in book two. And if you are watching for it, which we will talk about in one of my bonus episodes, you literally can see it building from there. And it is amazing. And I love this couple. And every time they show up, I'm excited. And I just love it. I love it so much. I don't have words. So it was my number one and it continues to be my number one. I actually don't let myself reread it very often. So this was a treat. I've only reread it, I think, two or three times now because I don't want it to just lose the luster. But oh my god, I just love this book so much. So that is still my number one that I would have said that was my number one coming in. Um, but I would say Kiss of Snow, I originally gave four and a half to this time I gave it five. And I, I emotionally connected so much more with Kiss of Snow this time around than I remembered. Um, so I would say in terms of the ranking, that was probably my happiest surprise is just really appreciating the craft of Kiss of Snow in a way that I hadn't before. Okay, transitioning into themes and motifs. You know, I think a lo I think I part of what I'm so impressed by upon this reread is that what Nalini Singh did is set up a world that allowed her to have so many layers of metaphor in the world building and in the different dynamics between characters, which to me just shows like that to me is speculative fiction done right is that it's not just a one trick pony in terms of like, this is a metaphor for, I don't know, racism, or this is a metaphor for um, medical ethics or whatever. Like there are so many layers to where she can go with the world she set up. And I love that she explores so many different kinds of like different potential meanings for some of the key aspects of her world building. So what I have in mind in particular are the Synet, um, silence, uh, and um, the nature of, I guess, like what it means to be a changeling. So let's start with the Synet. Different metaphors that have come up for me at different points um, for the Synet. Uh, one is just like straight up technology. So I think that this series was created at a time where the internet sort of like the transition from one web 1.0 to 2.0. So like really understanding kind of the impacts of technology and, and having a more, I think that this vision of the future is more grounded than some of the ones that came before it because it can include in its imagination what we know about how the internet impacts people. So I think technology, it can t the Synet is definitely, I think, a metaphor for technology. Um, and the season two in particular, I feel like it's a, it's definitely can be seen as a metaphor for climate change because basically the Synet is deteriorating all around our characters and they're trying to figure out how to keep it alive enough that they can live in it. So I definitely think that that ends up being a metaphor. I particularly feel like in Last Guard, um, I was really emotional actually reading it with sort of the reveal of one of the ways that the Synet, um, how they can salvage part of it of just this idea of even though we continue to abuse our earth, like it continues to find new ways to live and to try to support us, um, which I know is anthropomorphizing the planet, but that I felt like that um, is definitely a, a very moving potential reading of the Synet. Uh, the surveillance state, I think definitely can be a metaphor here. Again, I think a very relevant topic when this series kicked off sort of in the post 9-11 um, global milieu. So um, yeah, I think that's definitely a pretty strong metaphor. And then uh, another one that can, comes to mind is thought control. So um be that through religion or ideology or whatever, like the sort of I, potential vision of connectedness equaling homogeny rather than connectedness allowing for um, diversity of thought, expression, being whatever. So there's, I mean, so many different ways you could take that. And similarly with silence. So I think a pretty direct metaphor could be like religious extremism. I think we definitely see that uh, throughout the series, particularly with Pure Psy and their relationship to silence. Um, fascism, I think definitely comes in there. Really just any kind of extremist ideology. Um, 
you know, racial purity is definitely an element there. Um, yeah, so I, I just think silence is a very rich potential metaphor throughout the series. And then um, I think where the changeling side of things introduces a lot of potential themes that get explored are, um, so kind of the analogy between the sign and the changeling of skin privileges versus psychic privileges. So this idea that, I, I think part of what I love about the changeling aspect of this world is that it's really a celebration of the physical, which I think, you know, that makes sense in the context of a romance novel, because I think historically in the history of romance novels, a lot of what they have, like their place sort of in pop culture or sort of the development of um, women in the last couple of centuries is a reclamation of the physical um, in terms of the sensual and women having bodily autonomy and sexual agency. So it makes sense to me that a romance novel would be uh, reveling in or celebrating the physical. But I think part of what I love is that the Psy and the Changeling, I think really what we see kind of the overriding thesis um, metaphor of the series is just this idea that difference is good and difference complements each other. So we have this sense of the physical being as real as the mental and vice versa. Really the celebration, I think, of like psychosomatic wholeness of what it means to be human, that we are as much our minds as we are our bodies and we are as much our bodies as we are our minds. I think that this is really kind of a, I mean, who, I, I didn't talk to Nalini Singh about this, but I think what the text is suggesting is sort of a rejection of this idea of, a common sort of notion of of um, of the self, which is just that we are sort of like these meat bags that are animated by our souls, which is the quote unquote real us. I think this is really a celebration of our bodies as being the real us. And I think we really see that in the changelings. Um, and I think it's interesting that in general, you can trust the changelings animal side. So I think it's both that you can trust your physical experience, you can trust your body, but I also feel like it can be a celebration of sort of the intu intuitive, the sort of ineffable gut of like, you can trust your gut kind of a thing or sort of like your most primal self. Um, so yeah, I think that there's a lot of layers to things you can do with the changeling. I also feel like the packs, because they're so loved by the fandom, especially as the series goes on, I'm like, basically what's being described in the pack is like an idealized, like communism actually realized because we've never had like a truly communist um, political state um, in the history of the world. We've had socialism, but we have not had communism. But really like what's being described is like radical communal living um, that is certainly able to be corrupted. I think that that's something that she really is exploring in season two is I think season one was a lot about the Sinet and like the downsides of being Psy. We definitely still have that in season two, but I think in season two, we're getting a much more nuancing of um, changeling life and it not being as idealized uh, as it was in kind of the, the first season, because we see a lot of like what happens if the, that side is corrupted um, and I, I think in general, that's definitely a theme of the series as a whole is what happens when communities are corrupted um, and what happens when it, it's like it, kind of in both directions. So like you can see the Synod as being a stifling version of homogeny and unity of all people being forced to be the same so that you can have unity um, and that being bad, like that, that is a corruption, but also the, the changelings have learned that being too disunified is also bad and leads to death and destruction because we saw that with the changeling wars. So like really what we're looking for, like where the, the series I think is guiding us is that this sort of co uh, idealized commune <laughs> that the packs are living in um, or, but like, can be extrapolated, but it has to respect, like, 
what would it look like basically for this world to be living in perfect accord? And it would be that the Cynet has connections to all three races. It has Psy, Changeling, and Human connection. Um, it needs that for it to survive. But like we have individuality. Individuality is not sacrificed at the expense of community, nor is community um, prized to the point where you become uh, like completely stult, like exclusionary of, of outsiders. I feel like I'm not articulating this exactly the way that I'm trying to. But anyway, I think that that's certainly an overriding kind of theme we see throughout the series. Um, let's see here. What else did I write down? I think that there's an exploration of this, of like what emotions even really mean. Um, for instance, like ambition is something that's okay under silence, but love isn't. And, and really exploring like what kind of values we ascribe to different kinds of emotions. Um, I've enjoyed that throughout the series. Uh, also parenting or sort of relationship building in the face of adversity. I think particularly in my re-listen to my episodes, what I appreciated this time in my reread was um, understanding the growing affinity and contrast between Nikita and Anthony and their approaches to parenting under under silence. And I think that really that kind of so I love that I, I really hope we get <laughs> Nikita Anthony like novella at least at some point I would love that. Also because I think that could be an exploration of like an asexual kind of potential relationship, which I don't feel like we get a lot of in romance. But anyway, um, but I think sort of in general, that different people react differently to the downsides of the of, of side powers and of um, sort of overall societal institutions. So, you know, Nikita's strategy was in one direction and Anthony's was in another with respect to their children who both of them deeply love and would do pretty much anything for, but they have different responses and that affects their kids in different ways. Um, but I think in general, we see a lot of different responses to, um, sort of the trauma that people have experienced in, on, on all sides of the equation here. Like we have some people responding with, trying to lock things down and have control, other people rejecting that and wanting total freedom. There's some people who want order, there's some people who want chaos. Like, I think that there's just a lot of nuance of using these sort of metaphors of trauma and like mental health related issues and how different people respond to that. And I think that this, uh, both in talking to Nalini Singh, but also just in the text itself, I think that there's a real empathy for the fact that different people respond to the same circumstances differently. Um, and again, I think that that just drives back in general to something that I see in this series, which is just that it is a real celebration of, of difference and the fact that you can still have community and unity in the while allowing for difference. That seems to me to be the message over and over and over again of this series. It's just the beauty of individuality, but that individuality shouldn't be apart from a communal context. Like really the series is about building relationships, building networks of support and reliance and that's like interpersonally, but also geopolitically. So that I think is definitely, if I was going to say is like the message of the series, that to me seems to be what the message is, which also definitely plays into, I think, a lot of like kind of themes or suggestions about like interracial romance. This book is radically racially diverse um, and very casually so, which I think was a unique feature of the early aughts, probably. Like, I don't know if there was a ton of people doing that, but race as we know it is integrated into this series incredibly diversely and casually. And really it's the racial differences between being Psy, being changeling, or being just sort of like a straight up human. That's where the interracial focus is for the series, which I think is a really effective metaphor um, and really wonderfully handled. So anyway, those are some of the, th the ideas I have about themes. And then three motifs I wanted to call out, which I know you guys probably got sick of hearing me talk about throughout the reread, but one is this constant repetition of the idea of play, which I eventually came to see as I ended up defining that as joyful vulnerability, that a lot of times the invitation to play is an invitation to be um, 
just, yeah, joyfully vulnerable with someone that you can let down your guard, you can enjoy life together, um, and you don't have to kind of have your your game face on. Um, I think we see that verb coming up a lot in this series. Um, also hair, I think being a metaphor for intimacy, um, or it's a motif that comes up a lot and it seems to represent, um, again, letting your guard down, mostly in the context of romantic relationships. But I think interestingly, as the series goes on, it broadens even from that to also include um, sort of like offers of friendship. Uh, yeah, you see um, friends doing each other's hair. So I think just generally like relational intimacy, that seems to be kind of what it what it represents. Um, and then also just a motif of sisters, particularly in peril. Um, I think that was particularly true early in the series. Uh, but just generally, there's a lot of very complicated sibling dynamics in this series, um, which I guess makes sense. It's a version of a family dynamic and there's a lot of family dynamics in the series but in in particular I feel like this has more than a, the typical share of sibling stuff so man did we do it I feel like we did it I feel like I've been talking for a very long time um let's transition into what happens next so we've made our way through the main books you guys will be hearing from me again on Side Changeling for three episodes. You will be getting the two bonus ones I talked about. And then also I have already recorded my review um, or like the episode for Storm Echo. Um, as long as these books continue to come out and as long as I guess I'm paying my hosting fees on the podcast, I will continue to check in with you guys as we get new entries in this series. So season one is over with an asterisk. It will continue for as long as it needs to. So that, that's kind of season one wrapping up. Um, I'm still enjoying this and I would still like to continue with the podcast. I think for season two, we are going to explore my favorite currently writing author and that is Alona Andrews. So I have read the first three books in the Innkeeper Chronicles from Alona Andrews, which do feature a changeling character increasingly prominently um so I feel like it counts <laughs> for this for this project but I've not ever done a reread and there are some new entries that I have not read they I kind of Alone Andrews I love so much that I tend to sort of hoard their books so that I can read them later so season two is going to be us reading that series together I think that there's only a few when we count the novellas I want to say there's like six total but before we even get into that we're going to have a transition one because there's a new spinoff series from the Kate Daniels series featuring Julie so we are going to start with that book which is called Blood Air and I anticipate probably getting going with that, like, let's say, uh, August ish, I think this time, probably I'm going to try to get ahead a little bit before I start publishing the um, podcast. So I don't know, let's say like August, September ish, we'll get started on that. So you guys will hear from me again in July, um, for the sort of wrap up of season one. And then we'll get going again sometime in August or September, but we're going to have sort of a, a entree of blood air. And then we'll transition into the Innkeeper Chronicles um, by Alona Andrews. So I'm very excited about that because like I said, Alona Andrews is my favorite currently writing author. Spoilers at the time of this recording. Literally last night, I got to read an arc of Ruby Fever, which is their book coming out in August, which I absolutely, <laughs> so good. Also, I think that that, the Hidden Legacy series has some interesting parallels to Side Changeling in terms of how it deals with mental magic. Something to think about. But anyway, uh, so that is the plan going forward. And I guess I've been talking so long. I feel like that's probably it for now. Thank you guys so much for being so supportive and enjoying and sharing and all that with the season one. Um, I've really enjoyed doing this. I'd been wanting to do a side changeling reread for quite some time. And this was such a fun way to do it. I'm also selfishly just very excited to have this available for myself when I am continuing in the series to be able to go back and be like, what? Can you pass? Mara, can you help me? remember all the things because I just I don't know I'm like a goldfish I feel like sometimes where I 
just let things completely evaporate from my brain. So I'm glad to have this record. Uh, I hope you guys will also find that helpful. Uh, and yeah, I guess for now we'll be off for a couple of months, but you'll hear from me when Storm Echo is coming out. Uh, and in the meantime, definitely take a moment to rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to it. Uh, share it with your friends. You can follow me. I will still be posting at Books Like Woe pretty much everywhere, so particularly YouTube. But you can also find me on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter-ish, Goodreads, all of those things. You can find me at Books Like Woe. And thank you so much for coming along for season one. I'll talk to you guys in a couple months and stay well. Bye!